Hello, my name is Mike Willette with the National Native Network, a program of the Intertribal Council of Michigan. And welcome to the NNN webinar, webinar series on cancer risk reduction in Indian country. This webinar is titled Intergenerational Trauma Among American Indian and Alaska Native Women and Its Impact on Women's Health and Cancer Screening. This technical assistance webinar is being hosted by the National Native Network, which offers technical assistance and resources for commercial tobacco and cancer prevention and control throughout Indian country and the California Rural Indian Health Board. Your presenter today is Selena Donahue, a public health ad advocate and Pueblo. Her family is Hoopa and Yurok and Karuk. She was raised on the Hoopa Valley Indian Reservation in rural northeastern Humboldt County, California. She graduated from California State University of Sacramento in 2008. She currently is a health equity advocate and a talking circle facilitator and has 17 years in clinical pathology. She has been working in public health for over a decade and has successfully collaborated with numerous tribes, Indian health services, community clinics, and different stakeholders in the healthcare community over the past several years as a result of her collaborative efforts. There has been a significant increase in health and cancer screenings. No commercial interest support was used to fund this activity. A post-webinar evaluation will be emailed from the Zoom platform 24 hours after today's presentation. We'd love to hear how we did today. There will be no continuing education units for today's presentation. Through this presentation, you will gain an increased knowledge and understanding of the history and historical trauma amongst Native Americans and Alaska, uh, Native Americans and AIAN women. Understand the barriers within Native American populations and the impact on women, women's health, and gynecological cancer screenings. If you have any questions, please type your questions into the Q&A box. Questions will be answered during the last few minutes of the webinar. Thank you, and now, Selena Donahue. Hey, Young, hello. My name is Selena Donahue, and thank you for joining our webinar today. So our topic today is intergenerational trauma among American Indian women and its impact on women's health and cancer screening. So our agenda today, we're going to cover, here's our topics, and each topic we could go a deeper dive, so we're just going to be covering the surface of each topic. So we're going to cover the history of Native American um, the historical trauma, we're going to go over a couple stories, what works, and its evidence-based interventions. And like I said, each one of these topics is a webinar in itself, so we're just going to cover the surface of each of these topics. Okay, so I always like to start off my webinars with land acknowledgement. So whose land are you on? So go ahead and type in the chat box, whose land are you on? So here again, I was born and raised in California. So here is a map of the California Indian pre-contact tribal territories. So I know whose land I'm on. I'm on Yurok, Hoopa, and, and your uh, crooks tribal territories, but go ahead and acknowledge whose land you are on. So just take that few moments and type in the chat box and acknowledge whose land you are on. Okay, honoring original indigenous land. We are grateful and we acknowledge the native people's land we are on. This is ancestral homelands that we gather. And this is as well as the diverse and vibrant native communities who make it their home today. So again, we're just taking this moment to acknowledge the original indigenous land.
So I want to, this slide is really important. So this is a timeline of the colonization of American Indian policies and timeline. And I kind of put up this timeline because these dates are really important. We could do, like I said, a deeper dive into each and every one of these dates, but I kind of wanted to highlight a little bit of each of these important dates because we're going to be talking about the history and the historical trauma of Native Americans. So if we look at 1819, that was the US Civilization Fund Act. This is where forced American Indian children were forced into boarding schools. They were taken away from their families and forced into boarding schools. 1850 was the Government and Protection of Indian Acts. There was a bounty on Native American adults. So this was in 1850. We go down this timeline 1893, that was the General Allotment Act. So this was where they were taking away Native Americans and reservation lands. They were breaking it up and privatizing reservation lands. We keep going down to that timeline. 1975 was the Indian Self-Determination and Education Act. 1978, the American Indian Religious Freedom Act. So I just kind of kind of want you guys to get these dates in your head and see this timeline of American Indian policies. So this is really important. And so when we're talking about historical trauma, in California, our very first governor, 1849 to 1851, our very first California governor, Peter H. Burnett, he declared that a war of extermination will continue to be waged between the races until the American race becomes extinct. Let me repeat that. Our very first California governor in California, he waged that all Native Americans must be extinct. So again, that a war of extermination will continue to be waged between the races until the Indian race becomes extinct must be expected. While we cannot anticipate this result, but with painful regret that inevitable destiny of the race is beyond the power of wisdom of man to avert. So when we're talking about history and we're talking about historical trauma and our distrust of government, our very first governor in California, he wanted to extinct Native Americans. In 1851 to 1852, our California legislation authorized a payment of 1,000 10,000 for the suppression of Indian hostiles. So that is a lot of money today, $1,000, $10,000 today in 2021. Just take a moment to let that sink in of how much money that was in 1851 and 1852. Our California legislation authorized that payment for the suppression of Indian hostiles while theoretically attempting to resolve white Indian conflict, these payments only encouraged white settlers to form volunteer companies and to, to try to eliminate all Indians in California. So I want you to just take that moment and have this sink in. So when you think about history, when you think about our government and you think about historical trauma, this all comes from our government. So. This came from our California legislation that they actually had a payment out for Native Americans to make them go away. So talking about historical trauma, today current and generational issues affect Native American communities, families, and individuals. There is no simple solution. Historically, Native Americans have been marginalized by government policies, such as sending Native American children to boarding schools where they are taught to assimilate, resulting in displacement or extermination of their communities. There can be a feeling among Native Americans that everybody hates you, and these attitudes and conflicts are passed down through generation and generations. Additionally, there are problems with economics and political disparities. 
many people think that this was, this was happening hundreds of years ago. I know for me, like my husband's grandma was in boarding schools. A lot of people I know, their parents were ripped away from their families and their communities and in boarding school. So a lot of times this is just one generation removed. This is just not happening that long ago. So when we're looking at this picture or we're talking about historical trauma, this is not that long ago. A lot of times it's just one generation removed. So what is historical trauma? Historical trauma is a constellation of characteristics associated with massive cumulative of trauma across generations. These events don't just target an individual, they target a whole collective community. The trauma is held personally and can be transmitted over generations. So when we're talking about historical trauma, the truth, we also want to talk about that healing process as well. Historical trauma is entirely different than consciously holding on to the past. It's not like we're holding a grudge. It's entirely different than holding on to the past when it resides in your ancestral memory and DNA. It results in numerous defense mechanisms, developmental malfunctions, and behavioral issues. This is scientific and it is supported in studies. So how does trauma get passed down through generations? Trauma, like from extreme stress or starvation, among many other things, can be passed from one generation to the next. So this is how. Trauma can leave a chemical mark on a person's gene, which can be passed down to those future generations. This mark, it doesn't leave a genetic mutation, but it alters the mechanism by which that gene is expressed. This alteration is not genetic, but it is epigenetic. So this is how, when we're talking about, you know, generational trauma, this is passed down generation through generation. So when we hear that word genocides, what does that mean to you? Genocides, many people often think of a gas chambers or mass murders or, you know, mass murders by machetes. But crime of genocides is defined as, as I quote, the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. The definition of genocides includes killings, but also includes less visual measures, such as preventing births within groups, which is a, which is a goal of forced sterilization. So we're going to talk about a couple stories and examples of sterilization and this historical trauma. So we all know about the 1890 Woundini Massacre, which occurred on the Pine Ridge Reservation. In 1973, the Wounded Knee occupation took place a short distance from the original battlefield. Between 1973 and 1976, there were 3,400 sterilizations performed at Indian Health Services facility with marginalized understood consents. These historic events are still a part of that community and conversations today. Understanding the history and incorporating that inter information and interactions with the patients and the community are an important part of gaining the trust and sharing a common view of life on the reservations. Another example, there is a book out there called The Lost Generation, American Indian Women and Sterilization Abuse. Quote, I had been sterilized at the age of 11 at an Indian Health Service Hospital in here in the early 1950s. I got married in the 1960s and I went to the doctors and he told me that I had a partial hysterectomy. When I was a child, we we were given vaccinations and mine got infected and a nurse came to me and gave me a shot so I wouldn't hurt. When I woke up, my stomach was hurting and bleeding. So one third of the sterilizations that were going on were given to girls under the age of 18. These sterilizations were happening to girls as young as the age of nine. The Indian Health Services applied four sterilizations to 3,406 women. We know that that number is much, much higher. 
So what we know, we know that that forced sterilization, number one, is a modern form of genocides. In 1970, a Family Planning Service and Population Research Act came out. We also know that 25% of Native American women of childbearing ages were sterilized. And there's evidence that show that we know that this number is much, much higher. And just take a moment to think about that number, 25% of childbearing Native American women were sterilized. And some of these procedures were performed without consent, under pressure or duress, or without their knowledge or understanding. And most of these women were under the age of 18. And a lot of the sterilizations were happening in the 1960s and the 1970s. That is not that long ago. So when we're thinking of the sterilizations, a lot of us are thinking this happened hundreds of years ago. In the 1960s and the 1970s, many of us were born. Many of us were children. Many of us were even teenagers in those 1960s and 1970s. And this was happening to many of our Native American children. And in 1976, the government admits to this unauthorized sterilization of Indian women. So one, four of the 12 Indian Health Services admitted of doing these unauthorized sterilizations. So only four of the 12 were caught. That We know that that number is much higher. They, the Indian Health Services, they said 3,406 Native American women were sterilized without their permission. And that was only between 1973 and 1976. That's only three years. And that's only what was found in the court of law. So again, we know that that number is much higher and we know that that unauthorized sterilization was going on for a much, much longer. So now we're talking about women's health and cancer. So now we kind of got that history. We got that, how that historical trauma works. And now we're moving on to that women's health and cancer screening. So we know Native American women have the lowest rate of mammography. Native American women have the lowest rate of mammography of all ethnic groups. One study found that 36.6 of Native American women over the age of 40 have not received their mammogram within the past year. And we know these rates vary region by region. And if you are a health clinic and you work with the patient population, Type in the chat box maybe some how you work with your patients on getting um, your patient screened because we know we want that number to move up. We know we want that number to be above 50. So what are some things that you are doing to help get our native population screened? Um, I know some people are having a mammogram come to their communities. So just type in the chat box some things that you are working with in your community to help increase those screening rates. I would love to hear about those. Another one, the HPV, the human papular virus. So we know cervical cancer is the most common HPV associated cancer among Native American women, while orphopaginal cancer is the most common HPV associated cancer among Native American men. HPV vaccine is recommended for everyone ages 9 to 26 to protect against HPV. HPV is common for cervical cancer. Whoops. Oh, sorry. This went back. So HPV is common infection that causes 99.9% .9 of cervical cancers and the majority of other HPV cancers. Cervical cancer is disproportionately affects Native American women. So we know that Native American women are nearly twice as likely to develop cervical cancer compared to white women and four times as likely to die from it. Additionally, we are often diagnosed at a later stage. This to me is very powerful and this is something that we can change. 
because we could bring that number down because we know that with cervical cancer that we could bring that number down by getting our HPV vaccination. So what is it that we can do? And we, as native women, we don't need to be four times as likely to die. And we don't need to be diagnosed at a later stage. So this is something that I know that we could change. And we know there are a number of barriers to cancer screening, such as the cultural reluctance to access to Western medicine. So we talked about that. So we know that a lot of Native women don't want to go to the doctors and see Western medicine for non-acute health problems. And we talked about that because of that, that distrust. Um, we know that transportation difficulties is a barrier. We know that a lack of childcare negative perception of healthcare providers, long waits for appointments, poor patient provider communications. Um, this one is a big one too. I remember facilitating a talking circle on a reservation and I had an elderly lady one time tell me, my doctor called me a beast. And I was like, what do you mean your doctor called you a beast? She's like, yeah, I was in my doctor's appointment and my doctor kept calling me a beast. Well, to find out her doctor was telling her she was obese. So we really need to reevaluate that patient provider communication. What our provider might be saying is not what our patient is listening to. You know, when we're talking about our health providers, what can we do? How can we bring in those Native American providers? Someone who we can associate with, someone who, you know, how can we bring down these barriers. So that's what we're gonna talk about next is some of the barriers too. So we know that culture affects how people communicate with, understand and respond to their providers about healthcare. This means it is crucial for providers to be culturally competent, recognize the beliefs, the language, the traditions and the health practices of the, of the patients and apply that apply their best knowledge and give the best care. So this needs to be the motto for every healthcare provider. And if we have a way to bring in those Native American health providers, that's gonna be a really big key. So when we're talking about barriers, so we talk about barriers, transportation. We know transportation is a barrier. I know where I live, we have an Indian health clinic, but the hospital, the local hospital is an hour away. Those road conditions, the distance, the weather. When we talk about women's health screening, um, we usually have a mammogram van that comes up, but in the wintertime, the roads are too, the roads get um, snowed in. We used to have a bigger mamma van a, mammo, a mammography van come in, but the roads were too narrow. So that van wasn't able to come in. So transportation can be a, a barrier. So what can we do to help limit some of these barriers? We know financial barrier can be a huge barrier for a lot of our patients. Many of our patients have no insurances. Many of them, they don't even know what their insurance status is. A lot of us with our Indian health clinics, we have a referral system, but what does that look like? How can we push those referrals through? Um, a lot of times when they're going out for, they could get a cancer screening, but once they need that cancer treatment, getting that referral out, what does your referral system look like within your clinic? Cultural and belief system. This is a really huge one. Religion, spirituality, Concepts of illness and death, then the traditional Native American healthcare beliefs and practices. This one is a really big one, especially when we're talking about big health systems. Let's say once you're diagnosed with a cancer and when you are at a hospital, um, if you want to burn, like for us, we have engine root, you know, you can't burn your engine root in a hospital. So working with those health systems on our culture and our belief systems, how can we work with those bigger health systems on our cultural and our belief systems? Um, so many patients, you know, if they're at their end of life, um, what can we do to make them more comfortable or to bring them home? So working with those bigger facilities on our culture and our belief systems. So we need to be able to integrate our 
culture and our belief systems with that Western medicine as well. So we need to be able to integrate them together. And like I said, each one of these are a deeper dive in itself. We're just covering the topic of each because they could be a deeper dive in itself. We know cost is a barrier, travel, housing, utilities, the cost of fuel and oil. So when we're talking about cancer and cancer screening, what happens once that patient is diagnosed? So if you're in a rural community and you go to your IHS clinic or your Indian health clinic, and then you go out and you need to get those chemo treatments. I know for us, where I live on our reservations, sometimes you have to drive five, six hours away. What does that cost look like? What about those caretakers? How is that travel, those housing? How is all that gonna be covered? Because some of those treatments are six to eight weeks. Who's gonna cover those costs? Is it the tribe? Is it the clinic? Is it their insurance? So that cost could be a barrier because you also need someone to drive them. How are they gonna get there? So think about these barriers and what can we do as that organization to reduce that cost and that barrier. Social structure as well. So when we're talking about cancer screening, who are we talking to? So we know that breast health screening starting at the age of 40, who are you talking to? Talk to those extended families. Who are making those decisions? Um, a lot of times, you know, maybe talking to the younger kids as well, because they're the ones who are going to be driving their grandparents, driving their parents. So we need to think about that social structure, that extended families, because in our Native communities, we have those extended families. So who are we giving that information to? We know who needs to be screened. We know at what age but who are we giving that information to? Who is making those decisions? So thinking about that social structure, because let's say someone is needing to go for their pap screening, or like I said, their mammogram, who's physically gonna be driving them? So we need to make sure that we, as that organization, when we're talking about cancer screening, that we are reaching out to those extended families. We know that age group, that needs to be screened, but we gotta be able to reach out to those extended families. So we believe in using our way. Native communities have the wisdom to find a solution. Our knowledge, education, and our way of learning has been through gathering, storytelling, songs that have been passed down through generations, through generations. That is who we are. That is how we learn. Talking circles. Talking circles is a good way to pass down that education. So when we're talking about educating our communities about women's health screening, so when we're talking about getting screened for the vaccine for the HPV, getting screened for cervical cancer, getting screened for mammography, how are we passing down that education? We know as natives that our way of learning is storytelling, is through talking circles. That has been our way through centuries. As Native Americans, we are storytellers. That's how we gather. That's how we pass down knowledge and information. That's been our way from the beginning of time. And if you have not incorporated talking circle, reach out. This is a really good way to pass down that information. And you could talk about some risk factors. You could talk about symptoms. Sometimes just passing out a piece of paper, that information is not going to stick in. Use what works. It's easy to feel overwhelmed by the need for culture competence to reduce healthcare disparities. But there are things that we can do to make progress towards a more equitable care. Providers should be aware, uh, be aware that racial and ethnic disparities exist. That is the key, having the providers know that they exist and that they are supporting to help eliminate these disparities while preserving the culture because culture is our key and culture is who we are. So moving on to what works, how can we incorporate this? What works? So priorities and evidence-based intervention. So we know that provider assessment and feedback works. We know provider reminders, 
client reminders, reducing structural barriers, talking circles goes in that, and quality improvement processes. So these are the evidence-based interventions that we know that works. So some supporting strategies, using small media, but really incorporating culturally appropriate materials, doing professional educational development trainings, making sure that it's cultural competencies, and doing patient education. Quality improvement process. So providing technical assistance such as QI coaching um, and working with tribes, tribal coalition, maybe the American Cancer Society, national coalition, state boards. Here's an example. We were working with one of our Indian Health Services, um, Kamau, which is up in our um, my reservation. Kamau means good medicine. And this was the collaboration of American Cancer Society, California Rural Indian Health Board, UC Davis. So it's a collaboration, not one entity could do it by itself, but the collaboration and doing that quality improvement process. So working together, that's gonna help improve those process and those cancer screenings. Small media, health communications. So many people and many clinics, they're, they're wanting those culturally appropriate materials. These are some materials I know the National Native Network is really good at that. I know California Rural Indian Health Board is really good, but making sure you have those culturally appropriate materials out there. People want to see people like us on flyers. We don't wanna see you know, people that don't look like us or we, we want information that relates to us. So make sure that you have culturally appropriate materials. If you don't have them, reach out and ask where you could get some of those materials. So some of your best practices, um, knowing your history and those cultural values. Many times when I do trainings and webinars, many of the providers have no history of the Native American history. They don't understand the historical trauma. They don't understand why we have a distrust. So understanding that history. When we're, when we're talking about this historical history, the intergenerational trauma of why there is distrust, this, the sterilization that was happening just in the 1960s and 70s, it's important to know that history so you know why there is that distrust, maybe why our screenings are low. So understanding the why is going to get you to how, to the how, how we can get them screened. Listening to the needs, and the needs can vary from patient to patient. They're going to vary from clinic to clinic, but listening to the needs and be more adaptable, be more culturally sensitive and reflect on what is needed. Listen to their needs. Listen to what those barriers are and how we could break down those barriers and bring in the experts and be able to know that maybe a physician might be an expert in the Western health medicine, but bring in those experts from your Native American communities. Bring in the experts. We are not the experts in everything. So we need to be able to weave them in together. Thank you, and I'm open for questions, and thank you. Thank you very much, Selena. Great presentation, as always. Um, if you have any questions uh, for Selena, feel free to type them into the question box, and we will um, try to get them answered. We'll be doing the Q&A session all the way up until the top of the hour. Uh, so we have about 25 minutes that uh, we could dedicate to questions. Um, just real quick, I wanted to um, clarify one thing when I did my um, introduction read. Um, this technical assistance webinar is being hosted by the National Native Network and the California Rural Indian Health Board. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clarified. Um, this person here says, was there a policy to sterilize American Indian women and who signed off on it? There was not, so there was a policy to sterilize women, but not under the age of 21. And sterilization was being done to Native American women under that age, as young as the age of nine. And that sterilization was being done without 
their consent. So there was even stories of women who were going in for um, tonsillectomy ton for their tonsils and coming out with hysterectomies being done. So these stories were horrific. They, what was happening was horrible. And those 3,406 women, those were only the ones that were admitted in court from IHS. So like I said, we know those numbers were greater and much, much higher. And again, those were only the women that were that they found that were sterilized between 1973 and 1976. And again, many of us in those 1970s were being born, were children or teenagers. So this was not that long ago. Great question. Sorry, Selena, I think I had myself on mute there. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box. Please do not type them into the chat box. Um, that way I can uh, follow along down with the questions and get them uh, answered in order. So if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box. Uh, this person here says, which four, IH, or which four IHS areas were you referring to there? Oh, I have that, but not handy. Um, and we know that there was more, but there was only four that were in the report. Um, I could get that and I'll make sure I post those four IHS um, uh, hospitals and clinics that were um, in that report. And it looks like if there are some people that are posting some articles about okay. that um, in the Perfect. chat box Perfect, thank as well. you. <laughs> so just to note that as well. Um, let me see here. Um, this person here says, I was recently in a webinar that touched base on how it is not okay to assume people are native or not based on looks. For example, this elder had grandkids and nieces with blonde hair, blue eyes. How do you define an appropriate picture for advertisement? Um, you know, I always uh, say, you know, ask that person and you can always, it, it's up to that individual and Native American people come in all different sizes, shapes, forms, hair colors, eyes, and there's not one picture or one person that defines a Native American. Um, so it's, I, I did a training with another gal and we talked about, you know, referring and asking, you know, and I always say, you know, you, there's some do's and don'ts, you know, you never ask someone their blood quantum because that's a whole nother topic of how the government does blood quantums and counts you as a Native American and the disenrollment of being a federally recognized tribe. So that in itself is a whole nother webinar. And when we're talking about the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the government, and we have federally recognized tribes that were now not federally recognized tribes. So how do you define that? It It's on an individual basis and her try because there's so much, again, history and trauma that goes along with that. Well, thank you very much. Um, one person in the chat box asked, uh, where's a good place to order education materials with natives? So you can actually, I'm glad you asked, you could go to the National Native Network. They have a lot of information. You could go to the California Rural Indian Health Board. They have a lot of information. Um, and I will make sure I post on here some other references as well. All right. Um, just a quick plug here as well. Um, if anybody has any other questions, please type them into the Q&A box. Um, we'll be doing that up until the top of the hour, um, unless uh, there's no more questions to be had. Um, we are going to be archiving this webinar, so if you know of anybody that was unable to attend today, um, let them know that the archive of the webinar will be up uh, within 24 hours. 
at keepitsacred.org. Um, you look on the left side menu bar there and you'll see a resources tab and then a webinar archive tab and all the webinars are archived on that web page there. Also feel free to follow us on our social media on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Um, we are available to follow through there. Um, and yeah, as we said, uh, the webinar archive will be available within 24 hours up on our website, keepitsacred.org. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in. Were there any other notes that you wanted to mention at all? No, and you know, again, I always just tell people, know, number one, know whose land you're on, know your history, and really just take that time to take that little deeper dive into that history, the historical trauma. So then we can move forward on our health screenings and our cancer screenings, because that's gonna, especially for providers, when we're bringing in these providers into our clinics, that's gonna really help them get a better understanding of our communities. Because I always say, no matter what tribe you're from, there's never a word for cancer, usually in our tribal language. So understand that history. And if anybody has any other questions for you, they can reach out to you um, through the contact info on the screen, correct? Absolutely. Great. Well, um, let me see here. There's one other question. We commonly ask youth, how do you identify, how do you self-identify? Oh, this person was just making a comment. Oh. Um, okay, well, if there's no other questions, uh, actually, nope, some of them just filled in here and it didn't uh, refresh for me. Um, this one here says, uh, for those of us working to improve HPV vaccination rates, are there new vaccine opportunities as a product of dealing with the COVID pandemic that you think are presenting themselves for increasing HPV vaccination rates in First Nation populations? Um, so I always say reach out. To, so we ha usually have an HPV roundtable. I would definitely contact them. But when we're talking about vaccinations and screening, the best thing is do your cancer screenings and vaccination as, as much as you can, because when, especially in the COVID pandemic, you want to be able to screen and do your vaccine as much as possible. So if you could do, for instance, for your cancer screening, if someone is coming in, is there a way that you could do your pap screening, your mammogram, and your CRC screening? If you're doing a COVID test, is there a way that you could also implement that HPV vaccine? So almost a one-stop shop. So those patients don't have to keep coming back in. So make it as easy as possible for those patients. But again, for more information on the HPV, reach out to the HPV roundtable. There is a ton of information. And um, I know CRIB, California Rural Indian Health Board, I know you guys have a lot of stuff posted. Um, there is a ton of information on the HPV vaccine. Um, one person asked to just kind of show the historical dates from, from the beginning of the presentation. So they're on the screen right now. Perfect. Um, this person here says, um, we have had high turnover of providers at our clinics. In your opinion, what is the best way to engage these providers on the importance of cultural competency? Um, number one, just doing a cultural competency training with all providers, especially if you're having that turnover rate and giving them the basic history of your, your tribal information too, because those providers are coming in and they don't know anything about your community. So even just knowing these timelines, knowing that what, uh, knowing about historical trauma, a lot of these providers do not even understand historical trauma. So just giving them that basic cultural competency is gonna help them understand your tribe and your community a little bit better. Um, one person asked if you have any background on some of the images from the presentation. Those are all um, not the boarding school, but all of the other images are my family or um, my husband's um, reservation and his fishing hole and um, all 
um, like my daughter in her regalia, my son in um, his regalia. So those are all my um, images. I should have talked about those, so I apologize. I usually <laughs> do talk about them. <laughs> And uh, this person here says, why are vaccinations limited to age? Limited, uh, or, so the age- Like, why is there an age limit, I guess? So the HPV vaccination is because that's when, so the HPV vaccination is best because of their immune system is given at the age of nine, all the way up to the, tw up to the age of 26 and given in two doses because that's when it's best for their immune system to help prevent those different types of HPV cancers. Hey. And I'll get some information to be able to post on all of the HPV information. All right. Well, um, I don't see any other questions. I actually did uh, scroll down and refresh it this time. Um, don't see any more questions coming in. So um, we'll probably wrap it up for today. And uh, one more plug here. If um, anybody has any questions for Selena, uh, feel free to reach out to her um, at the email address and phone number on the screen. And be sure to follow the National Native Network on social media. And at keepitsacred.org, we will be um, posting a uh, archive of the webinar tomorrow. Also, everybody that attended will be getting a post-webinar evaluation link. Um, we hope that everybody will complete that just to let us know how we did. Thank you very much, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.